Um, yeah, the only reason I say Poetry Curator is my new title because um, I've done all these anthologies and um, I went to a party, um, <laughs> at a book party, and the chief buyer at a very, very, very distinguished bookshop, who shall be nameless, um, came up to me and she said, Daisy, um, it's amazing, you know, uh, you've got kids and everything and yet you've written so many poems. Um, <laughs> Okay, and I didn't, it was a difficult one for me because do you claim credit for, you know, the rhyme of the ancient mariner or do you just um, sort of go, well, you know, silly you sort of thing. So it was one of those sort of slightly awkward um, social situations. Um, and I'm here today really to talk about uh, why poetry matters and why it's not just, we think of it as something that's very beautiful, but the thing about poetry is also can be fantastically useful uh, as you go through life. And that's something that's kind of, um, occurred to me more and more as I get older. Um, I first was introduced to poetry by my grandmother who used to read to me from something called the Golden Treasury of Verse. You know, the Golden Treasury, it's a very sort of old-fashioned volume. And it's quite interesting, the idea of a golden treasury, because actually a treasury is a place full of valuable things, full of money. And I suppose to her and her generation, poetry was valuable. It was something that you know, that had, had, had a real value. It was golden. It was, it, was like, it was like spiritual currency. And I think that's something we've lost, um, which, is, which is a shame. We've got lots of other things, but I think we've lost that notion of poetry being part of the currency of our, of our popular culture. I mean, I'm sure most of you tonight could name one or two or maybe three books on the Booker shortlist. I wonder how many of you um, could name the poets on the T.S. Eliot Prize or the Forward Prize. It doesn't matter particularly, but I think, it's, I think it's a shame, and I think that's something that we've lost from, from our life. So I thought I'd just run through some of the poems that have been useful to me in my life, and I hope they might be useful to you. Um, the, first, the first poem I'm going to read to you is by a poet called Cavafy, and I came across this poem when I was having a sort of career crisis. I was in my mid-30s. I'd worked at the BBC for... Um, 10 years. Um, anybody who's worked at the BBC knows it's a wonderful place to work. It's full of fantastic, creative people. But if you stay there too long, you become institutionalized. It's like Soviet Russia. It's like the Poland that Mike was describing. It, it, it is a place that, that molds you in its own image. And I knew it was time to go. I knew it was time to go. And somebody offered me a fabulous job in a wonderful place in the center of town and lots of shops and all the rest of it and lots of creative freedom. And slightly more money and I was like but I couldn't make up my mind I couldn't decide to do it I was I was paralyzed with indecision so paralyzed in fact that I started to see a therapist um, and I went to see, I went to see this therapist who was Greek and um, I was kind of boring her I could see you know I mean therapists are meant to kind of uh, display no emotion they're not meant to kind of react in any way but I, I knew that I was actually boring her because <laughs> after a point after about well, quite a few sessions, maybe, maybe ten. She, she looked at me and she said, you know, you know what, um, I think I'm just going to give you, I, I really don't know what to say to you, I'm going to give, and for a therapist to admit that is quite bad, um, I don't know what to say to you, so I'm just going to give you a, um, a poem. Um, so read this poem and maybe that will help you make up your mind. So I'm going to read the poem that she gave me and it's called Ce fece il gran rifiuto, um, which means all kinds of things, and I'm not going to translate it because I can't. Anyway, and it goes like this. For some people, the day comes when they have to declare the great yes or the great no. It's clear at once who has the yes ready within him, and saying it, he goes forward in honor and self-assurance. He who refuses does not repent. Asked again. He would still say no, yet that no, the right no, drags him down all his life. And it was that phrase about the right no, and it just went like that. For me, it was like a light bulb going off in my head, and I knew then what I had to do, and I, I, left, I left my job at the BBC and went to, on to do other things, and it was totally the right thing to do. And you know, maybe I would have got there on my own, but, but actually it was the poem that distilled the essence 
of what the problem was for me. It was that thing of, you know, do you do the brave thing or do you take the risk or do you stick to the right now because the right now is so much easier, you know. And that's what poets do, you know, the great poets, great poems, what, what they've done, I mean, they, <laughs> there's no money in it, there's, I mean, there are a few perks like, you know, girls, boys, whatever, but the great thing about being a poet is that they go out there, they're kind of at the front line of, of experience and emotions, and they bring it back for us and they compress it into what um, Coleridge calls the right words in the right order, and that's what poetry does, and that's why it's so valuable in that sense. So, when I was an adolescent, um, I, of course, like all adolescents, liked Yeats, you know, tread softly because you tread on my dreams, all that kind of masochistic stuff. But actually, there were some much better poems out there, which I wish I'd read at the time. Um, and this one, so there are two, one's for boys and, and one's for girls. I'm going to read the one for boys first, and this is called Advice to Lovers by Frank O'Connor. And it goes like this, and it's sort of about... You know, you could read all those books like, you know, How to Get the Man You Want or, you know, How to Stop Falling in Love with Men Who Don't Like Tuesdays or whatever. But, but these, are, these, <laughs> these do the same job in, well, maybe, you know, a fraction of the time. So this one's called Advice to Lovers. The way to get on with a girl is to drift like a man in a mist, happy enough to be caught, happy to be dismissed, glad to be out of her way, Glad to rejoin her in bed, equally grieved or gay to learn that she's living or dead. So that's quite a useful one. Um, <laughs> but this next one, I think, is 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 really the um, is really the killer. And um, oh, whoops! I forgot to start my my stop clock. So you'll have to tell me when I'm. I'm <laughs> going on. This is by Margaret Atwood, um, who's, as we know, a fabulous novelist, but she's also an amazing poet. And this is one of my favourite poems, and this is the one that when I go and talk in schools, I read to all the sort of um, the sulky teenage girls. Sometimes they kind of look up and I think they get it. So this is the, this is the poem I would recommend everyone to, to read to their, to their daughters. It's called Siren Song. And it's, oh, and just before I start, you will all know, of course, that um, Odysseus, on his journey back to Ithaca, his, his homeland, um, went past an island where the sirens um, sang. And the siren song was irresistible, and he was desperate to hear it. So he made, uh, they were monsters, though, and if, if, if once you heard it, you were drawn in, inexorably towards it, and you would crash, your boat would crash on the rocks below. So, you know, they lured all these sailors to their deaths. But Odysseus wanted to hear it, so he made all the... Um, the sailors block their ears with wax and he tied himself to the mast and he heard the song and he was the only person to live and hear the siren's song. But he was desperate, obviously, to get closer to the sirens. But, so that's the idea of the sirens. So this is siren song. This is the one song everyone would like to learn. The song that is irresistible. The song that forces men to leap overboard in squadrons even though they see the bleached skulls. The song nobody knows because anyone who has heard it is dead and the others can't remember. Shall I tell you the secret? And if I do, will you get me out of this bird suit? I don't enjoy it here, squatting on this island, looking picturesque and mythical with these two feathery maniacs. I don't enjoy singing this trio, fatal and valuable. I will tell the secret to you, to you, only to you. Come closer. This song is a cry for help. Help me. Only you, only you can. You are unique at last. Alas, it is a boring song, but it works every time. <laughs> so, um, as you get older, you stop needing the, the love songs and quite the, the love poetry in quite the same way. And then you get to the point where you have kids. And um, I've got two kids, and one of them's 20. And the thing you realize, <laughs> I didn't realize that, you know, the, the early years are really hard. You don't get any sleep, and it's really difficult, and you get really grumpy, and then what you don't realize, it just <laughs> goes on getting harder, which is the, the sad thing. And um, 
I like this poem, which is by um, Cecil Day-Lewis, who is the father of Sean and Daniel and, um, and Tamsin. And um, this poem's a very good one, because it's a sort of antidote now to the thing now that we all do, which is helicopter parenting. We're all about keeping our children close, knowing where they are all the time, knowing what they're up to, making sure that we're filling their brains with useful stuff. But actually, you know, the hardest thing about being a parent is not keeping them with you, it's letting them, letting them leave you, giving them space. So this, this, um, this poem called Walking Away, and it's for Sean Day-Lewis, um, uh, Cecil's youngest son. Lines new ruled since I watched you play your first game of football, then, like a satellite, wrenched from its orbit, go drifting away. Behind a scatter of boys, I can see you walking away from me towards the school with the pathos of a half-fledged thing set free into a wilderness, the gait of one who finds no path where the path should be, that hesitant figure eddying away like a winged seed loosened from its parent stem, has something I never quite grasped to convey about nature's give and take, the small, the scorching ordeals which fire one's irresolute clay. I've had worse partings, but none that so gnaws at my mind still. Perhaps it is roughly saying what God alone could perfectly show. How selfhood begins with a walking away and love is proved in the letting go. And that's, I think, quite a useful <laughs> poem, really, because if you can do that, you can pretty much do anything. If you, can, if you can watch your child stumble and not rush to pick them up every time, um, that makes you possibly a better parent, I think. Um, and now on to, on to money, because obviously that's where, you know, that's why we're in the, in the mess that we're in. And um, I started my own business five years ago, which... Um, <coughs> was possibly a good idea, um, and I've learned a lot of things about it, but um, I felt a lot better when I found this poem by Robert Frost, you know, he wrote, um, you know, all those famous poems, The Way Through the Woods and the, the Road Not Taken, but he also wrote a poem called The Hardship of Accounting. Um, so here it is. Never ask of money spent where the spender think it went. Nobody was ever meant to remember or invent what he did with every cent. So <laughs> that's quite a good. My other favorite poem about money is uh, it's by someone called Richard Armour, and it goes, um, that money talks, I can't deny. I heard it once. It said, goodbye. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. That's, that, that's a very useful one with your accountant. Um, I was going to put, um, how much time? OK. Two minutes. Okay, two poems. I was gonna, I was gonna read a lot of poems, depressing poems about marriage, but I'm not going to now. I'm just gonna read one very quick poem about marriage, and this is called Mrs. Icarus by Carol Ann Duffy, who, as we know, is the poet laureate and utterly brilliant. And her book, The World's Wife, is fantastic. You must buy it immediately. And this is about Icarus, who, as we know, um, created wings out of wax so that he could fly. And this is called Mrs. Icarus, and she says. I'm not the first or the last to stand on a hillock watching the man she married prove to the world he's a total, utter, absolute, grade A pillock. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the light relief. And now we're going to have one more poem, one of my favourite, favourite poems by um, Cavafy, which is the... Last one, if I can find it, of course. I'm slightly embarrassed I don't know these poems by heart. I, last night, I did a, a gig with Edward Fox, and he read the whole of the four core text from memory. He just recited it, and it was extraordinary. So if you ever, if you ever get the chance to hear him do that, it's, it's worth doing. It's absolutely astonishing. Anyway, this is by, this is by um, Cavafy again, and it's called From Ithaca, which is, of course, the island where Odysseus was heading back to. Um, in, in, in his long journey. And I think it's one of those poems that's quite useful to have sort of by you at all times when you feel, what am I doing and why am I doing this? Or, you know, you feel under pressure because of whatever it is, you know, the pressure to, to achieve or do things. And just, it's a very good poem sort of to remind you 
why we're here. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvellous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you'll have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>